Hello and welcome to the 38th episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. Today is Saturday the 8th of February 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we continue our reading of Boss Level Chapter 9, Republican Democracy, and I lose the plot when it comes to discussing proportional representation. This episode was, of course, recorded before this election, where Corbynism got hung, drawn and quartered. This week, I have the new Patreons, Julian Hudson Mayfield and James Younghands to thank. If you too would like to help keep the good ship Alpha afloat, why not join the Patreon gang gang? From only $5 a month, you get two Patreon-only episodes, the right to vote on the Reading Group series, and other random stuff too. If you don't have any spare dough, why not just spread the good commie word and give me a nice iTunes review? The next Reading Group series will be starting in the coming week or two, so make sure to get those broom airs ready at hand. If you'd like to comment on the show, please do so on the YouTube channel and make sure to like, subscribe and share. And you can also find me on Twitter and Facebook too. Okay, to the discussion. We have the original, the core, the elite panel today. It's small, but by God, is it good. We have all the way from Arizona, the two-headed beast, Lex Solf. How's it going? <laughs> It's going. Yeah, it's going pretty well. It's going to be my birthday in a few days. And wow, well, I, for most of my uh, of my year, I've been doing live streams. Most of your adult yeah, life. Yeah, for most of my adult life. Yeah, I've been doing live streams about Mike McNair. And, you yeah, know. I came out of the womb doing a podcast about <laughs> Mike McNair. So well, let's hit straight into it because we want to do McNair and we want to maybe also get into a bit of Paul Cockshot's critique of McNair, which is pretty, pretty good in places and then pretty, pretty bad in places. But it's definitely an interesting critique. So let's get to it. OK, we've got two sections, I think, left. Let's hit it with fight for an opposition. Let me or Sophie, do you want to read fight for an opposition? As I have argued, the present problem is not to fight for a worker's government, but for an opposition that will openly express independent interests of the working class, chapter 7, without beginning with the struggle for an opposition, there is no chance of confronting in the future the problem of an alternative government authority to that of the capitalists. In parliamentary regimes, which are now a common form across most of the globe, the capitalists rule immediately through the idea that the point of elections is to give a legitimacy to a government that heads out the bureaucratic corrosive state and electing representatives to the parliament or other representative bodies is only a way of choosing a government. This fetishism of government forces the formation of parties and coalitions in which the capitalist immediate paid agents have a veto over policy and creates the corrupt duopoly monopoly of the professional politicians. Within its political regime, to govern is to serve capital and therefore to create a coalition that aims to pose as an alternative government within its political regime is to also to serve capital. To fight for an opposition is to assist that we will not take responsibility for government without commitment to a fundamental change in a political regime. Well, I, I think this has actually been a point of disagreement to a degree between us, Tom. I basically take this from McNair. It's kind of a good way of thinking of the rational reasons that people don't want to do electoralism, even if they'll win. And in a way, especially if they'll win. Now, most of the conversations you'll practically have about electoralism in organizing is, yeah, but that'll never work. <laughs> you know, we, we can't, we're not going to just like win an election against this well-funded candidate. But McNair is taking a different tack. Even if you do win, you're going to be bound to govern this state unless you have a mandate to do otherwise. Yeah, like, I don't disagree with his point, but I we're, we're talking about how you would go about getting to a situation whereby you have a large party that can actually do this thing. OK, if you're in England or if you're in America, you can't get to a stage where you have control of the party to actually do it. 
So in those situations, like, you know, these are just alternative strategies. Like, I'm not somebody who's big into entryism. I don't have firm opinions on it yet. But I do think that there is a case to be made for entryism where you have small parties that are blocked for your non-PR systems. I think there is a case for it. Like, just for example, t- today, there was a, a clip going around on Twitter from Sky News. It's one of their political shows, their main political shows in the UK. And it was about the front page of the FT. Now, the front page of the FT, apparently this weekend, came out in big words on the front cover, I think it was bright yellow. And they said, capitalism needs a reboot. And they're literally, were talking on Sky News about how if they don't do something, the communists and the socialists are going to take over the country. Like I, I, not in a way they're not talking in a way like oh Jeremy Corbyn's a communist or anything they're actually kind of saying the system is so messed up at the moment that if we don't do something we're going to get the commies in right that's incredible right the fact that they would even say that and it's not they're not talking about it from a scaremongering point of view it was more like an analysis of how messed up things are at the moment in the UK that's um remarkable yeah it's incredible so and like so the thing here is is that like if we look at the phenomenon of carbon whether he gets in or not like you know, for me don't think getting in will work in any long-term sense we're not going to get socialism out of it or communism right so i, I don't think that so but like what we can see from the fact of them even being in opposition and having you know reasonably you know radical social democratic type policies that it's right. causing the Tories, for example, is causing them to very much shift their politics to the left. They're now gone to basically a massive, they're saying they're going to spend an incredible amount of extra, you know, they're going to deficit spend and they're going to like pump money. Whether they will or not, they're saying they're going to do it. And I think it's definitely had an impact on a lot of the different policies they want to get through. They never actually did them in the last parliament. So like, if you could imagine whereby you could take over and ratchet and ratchet the policy further and further left and democratise your Labour Party or your Democratic Party more and more and more and more, make it radical, it'll actually pull the at, at the minimum, even if you don't get into the government, it will pull the, the Republicans or the Tories or whoever they are to the centre. Like at that point when you're doing that, then you can implement, you get to the stage where you're radical enough and you say, right, fuck this capitalism shit anyway. We're not even going to take power the next time. Fuck you, you do it. You know, like, so I think you could get to his position there, but I don't see how you can even get to this how you can even get to implement this strategy in countries like the UK or the US without actually going into these parties. Okay, and and I think that's like a sort of salient point is that when you're dealing with a first past the post system, it it affects strategy. I'm not sure I'm totally sold on what you're saying. You know, maybe this leads to an abstentionist strategy or something in first past the post systems. However, the thing I definitely agree on is that like that's an important variable that's not really talked about here. And it's one of the first things you learn in like political science when you comparing democracies or comparing, you know, bourgeois constitutional regimes. This kind of reminds me of conversations we ha- we've had in the past to where I make a distinction even between the U.S. and the U.K., specifically the Democratic Party versus the Labour Party. You, I don't know if you've changed your views, but you've kind of like elaborated more on your views and like a, a accepted a degree of skepticism. I guess to say like when when, it, when a debate and try to make the Democratic Party sound worse than the Labour Party, and then you go, in the past you've like insisted that they're more similar than I make than I understand. It makes me feel less even less confident about a kind of entryist version of the strategy at all, mm-hmm. honestly. And I think and I think again like. Maybe we're more in agreement now that this strategy isn't as sound in the U.S. or the U.K. as it would be in a in a country that doesn't have a first past the post system. I, I do think that, like, with another fifteen years of if the Labour Party gets more radical and radical, could they move to a situation where they actually? I don't. I don't know. Like, the party itself is so currently institutionally managerial. But but could it be taken over and pushed into a different way? I think that's definitely a strategy you, for example, it's a strategy you could implement and try and implement. Oh, it is. It is being attempted in the United States. 
Like, this is being attempted. But is the, it? Like, like the, the DSA, like, is... By, is, by who? Is, okay, so there's, there's a section of the DSA that are essentially, you know, justice Democrats. That, th- that The Democratic Party is their party, and they want to change that party. However, there is another section of the DSA that they want, want to do much of what you're saying, you know, move the conversation. It's We call it the Overton window. They want to push the Overton window to the left, move that to the left. And then they want to have what's sometimes called a dirty break, where they have an acrimonious split in the Democratic Party between the socialist bloc that they've built up within it once they have enough momentum. Now, I would very much like to see an independent socialist party from the Democrats. H- however, you know... Sorry, can you say it again? They want to build it up and then split at, a, at an opportune time. Yeah, so so again, I mean, there's more than two factions in the DSA. But for the ones that are taking part in electoral work and not just spitting the whole time, you know, the ones that are doing Democratic Party stuff and it's part of the strategy that they have in their head. You know, because there, there are abstentionists in the DSA, you know, <laughs> for whatever reason. And that that one had kind of angled towards social stuff and community organizing. But I'm not talking about them right now. Sorry. This is between what I would call, you know, like party loyalists and the dirty break faction. And even dirty break is sort of ideologized. It's, it's, it's much more likely to be a kind of a war of attrition with the Democrats having all the resources, but... I'm kind of more spiritually sympathetic to the dirty break people than the, than the loyalists. But like that's that's just the same old goddamn. It is. Yeah, know, it's it is thing from the 1970s. It is. We get in there, we get enough power, and then we split. It's the same old problem. It's it's just like another trot group trying to take over a thing and then split it off. It's going no. It's going to go nowhere. It's going to go it's nowhere. Not- but but I mean, what about the other strategy? What, what about the other party strategy where you're going to turn the Dixiecrats, I'm sorry, Democrats, <laughs> you know, you're going to turn one of the oldest parties in American politics in a fucking revolutionary socialist form? I, I, I just, I don't know. Like, in the American tradition, they had to start a whole new party to end, like, slavery. Okay? And so what, what you need is some kind of breakdown of the party system, which, you know, may very well be happening because fucking everything is melting down. We have Trump as president. And the Democrats are struggling to find an oppositional voice. Right. So it's not implausible that we're facing a breakdown of the current party system and that there could be some kind of push for realignment. But look, I don't know how you would actually seriously go about forming the next party for the new party system. But I don't know if stapling your fate to the Democrats makes sense. It seems like both the Republicans and the Democrats are are seeking chips and it, it's going to it's not clear which one's going to sink first or if they're both going to be able to recuperate or what exactly is going to happen. But th- we are, I want to say, I want to call it a crisis, but we have a, a, a situation where somebody who's been on the WWE and The Apprentice is the president. Democrats who want to only pick people who will lose against that man, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, what's wrong with the WWE? Anyway, I'm kidding. No, I'm not a WWE hater. It's just, it's just the the whole the whole mythos around liberalism and and like picking smart mm-hmm. people to run the country is is obviously not the case. And this isn't. It's not. It's not yeah. even. This isn't even a special case. This has happened several times now. It's just so grotesque now, and and kind of like a. a I don't know what the word is. Yeah, it's, it's comic or like silly. Yeah, it's, it, it, you can't, you can't do, big people show, are doing satire. Big show, big show. Yeah, exactly. Big it's a spectacle. Show. People doing satire suck now because like yeah. reality does it better for them. Yeah, satire is, I think, I forget who is the quote by, but when Henry Kissinger won the Nobel Peace Prize, satire became obsolete. This is who we need today. We need the big show to come in and do a big drama show. He'll take them out. He'll take them out. Seven foot one, the biggest sports entertainer in the world. That's how they build them. Wow. Sports entertainer. Now, I, I, I won't be satisfied until both candidates are from WWE. This whole McNair strategy, it seems very unfortunate that it's grounded in UK politics in particular. All, all three of us here seem to think that there's a flaw in the case of the US or the UK. I don't think it's even that grounded in the UK. It's more of a European book. The one thing we're going to get to now in the next section here is about like it's it's not about 
splits. We got to get away from splits. Okay. We got to get away from doing. We got to get to a situation where we enact strategies as a as a collective unity, and then the strategy works or not, and fuck it, we go on to the next one. That should be our modus operandi instead of splitting because we disagree on strategy. Now, if those guys in the DSA broke off at a at the at the right time, okay. It, maybe it's possible they could absolutely replace the Democratic Party. It, it, like, that's a possibility. It's, it's hard to imagine. You, well, imagine a load of trots saying, oh, no, we've got to wait a bit more before we split. Right. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah, no, that. Never going to fucking happen. Right. Yeah, they're going to split too early. They won't be able to not split. That can only be a strategy when you're completely dominant. And even then, you're probably better off just taking over the existing party structure. And getting rid of the rest. You know what people are like by how quickly they start talking about splits. You know, I was talking to a fellow there, um, previous guest on the show, you know, and the first thing you, when we were talking about this, you know, he was saying, oh, yeah, yeah, you got to get you got to get ready for the split. <laughs> and you're like, God, damn oh, my it. God, <laughs> you know, this, this this split is the problem, the problem. Oh, you know? Hmm. I mean, you know, if if you're an advocate of a change in the mode of production, you know, like that may justify being in a different kind of political formation. And the question is, do you line up with people you kind of have not much to do with initially at all? Does a dirty break make sense or is right or right now are our choices basically like do elections with the Democrats or don't do elections, you know, like I tend to think that there is, it's a little more complicated than that, but it would only be slightly more complicated than that. The middle option is like, you have to be very, very, very selective about how you do. And you need to be trolling. Like it's, it's just, you, yeah. You, yeah. And you're trolling and you're trying to like use elections as a means to get revolutionary ideas out into the public and you're not worried about winning. And this is, again, specific to oh, our I, I context, yeah. you know, but I think, like, you have to be very selective about elections. Well, let, let's just zoom in on this, like, the last paragraph that Sophie read. D- do, do you agree with this statement? W- within this political regime, to govern is to serve capital. Does that, like, fly with you? Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, because, you know... Yeah, I agree with that, yeah. yeah if so, then, you know lining up with one of those parties that has that goal we'll we'll never actually want that goal so lining up with them might be tactically useful right but ultimately is sort of dishonest about your intentions or something or i don't i don't know how to state that exactly could you get control of a party like the labor party and actually make their policies so radical that they will not get elected. Did I, isn't that something that happened in the 1970s? My British history is a little rusty. No, the lead, the lead, the Michael Foote got a got got a chance to do it, but I think probably similar to what Corbyn is doing now. Probably not much different. What, no, what about the stuff in with the lo, uh, quote "loony left"? Was this in the 1970s with um? That was that was militant. They were like a militant uh, faction that went in. They were a trot faction that went in, a part of the CWI. But a part of their thing was to actually do a break. A part of the strategy was actually to split. Right, right, yeah. In the end. Look, I'm not put, I'm not saying that these this is a likely winning strategy. I'm just saying it's a strategy that you could make a, a case for. Like, I think that you don't want to be in government, right? But I also think you've got to be able to get a political party that's big enough to exist in the system that you're existing in. There's no point in having a 1% or a 5% or a or a 10% party in the UK or the US because you won't win a goddamn seat. You, you just can't even get to a position where you're going to be dominant enough to threaten capital. You just, you can't get into it. I do agree with this point. <laughs> I, th- I think this is slightly different in the United States. You can win a House of Representatives seat or a state legislative position, or something like city council, which I wouldn't recommend, but, you know, it's there. You, right. you can win those things as a teensy tiny electoral formation. How many of them? Not fucking many. Not enough. And here, here's the thing. Whether we're talking about UK, US, or somewhere else, I think 
we have to keep in mind that the goal, according to a McNair strategy, is to win a majority, not a majority of seats, but a majority of support for your minimum program. And so if that is our goal, elections should serve that goal, right? Elections are not the goal. Winning elections are not a goal. Winning the, the seats are not the goal. The goal is to get a majority. If running and winning seats serves that that goal, then fine. But if it will distract from that goal, you shouldn't even bother. And I think taking this this strategy and, and like a lot of the strategies assuming kind of ideal situations and a lot of these conversations assume situations that are much more ideal than what we're in now. What we're doing what we're doing now is if we're going to bother with electoralism at all, it should just to be like to plant seeds and that's it, really. But it, we don't even have a party. I guess that's the way that the early SP day thought and even Lenin in left wing communism. When he's like, yeah, I don't care that things are different elsewhere. There's there's just a principle that you got to use the parliament for propaganda purposes. You got to use the elections for propaganda purposes. I, I can see that like still being like a thing. That's true, I think. I think that's undeniably true. But like, say, for example, my problem with, say, the DSA trying that thing now is that, A, that's not a dominant idea I don't think it's a dominant the- theory on the left to take over the left wing party in I don't know if I'd agree with that. I don't know if it's dominant, but it's it's not in But wait, 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 let me let me let me let me finish. Like to to turn it into a communist party. It, it but it is the I mean for the socialists like left right now to turn it into a communist party. Well, not a communist yeah? party. It's not that. This is what Labour Party Marxist entry is about. It's about turning it into a communist party. That's that's what it is. It's about like turning it into a Marxist party. Like I think until remember we're right we're beginning right at the start. You know we're, all the formations political formations that have been tried over the last century have been failures. So we're just we're just strategizing, just talking the bullshit. But like until like the left coalesces around and and not just weirdos, you know, podcasters like us, but actually the, it becomes the dominant accepted idea on the left can that strategy ever hope to work so like they may have the right strategy but to me it's like it just won't even work because it's not the right situation you know it's like trying to ski down a hill when there's no snow (laughs) the question is what do you do in those lull periods right like when there's nothing going on like that and the only thing i can say is that like you know, for the current, like, kind of climate of social, you know, upheaval, you know, electoral activity is mostly done in the gaps between some of the bigger, you know, uprisings or what have you. You know, like the the mass popular mobilizations that end up happening that are obviously antagonistic in a way that existing political actors can't really seize on very effectively and is often directed against them. It's only really when those things go away, you get something like electoral activity that seems to correspond with that spirit. You know, it would be interesting to see if there is something genuinely in that trollish spirit that doesn't get subsumed into the machine in some sort of, I don't know, ideal electoral capacity or even, you know, sub-ideal electoral capacity, that when those movements hit, you know, these people use their mouthpieces to fan the flames of discontent and to amplify that kind of shit. But now that, now that I'm saying it, I'm thinking about people that were like, there are people in the Occupy movement that are upset and I understand that and that is why I stand with them, you know, and we'll just kind of say that and move on. Like, there are people that do that. But it's, I don't know, it's hard, it's kind of hard for me to imagine there being people like the early Social Democratic Party of Germany Like when it was just kind of, you know, they had two antagonistic, you know, legislatures that would just sort of shout at, you know, the rest of them, more or less, that would make their cases passionately and antagonistically. If something like that existed, that could plausibly like associate themselves with the next uprising and wouldn't immediately be thrown out because people don't already fucking hate them, which is totally hard to imagine. I can see some role for elections there. But the reason that I'm going for troll candidate, Tom, is because I I don't want to be an abstentionist and ignore elections entirely. 
And given the playing field that I see before me, it's hard for me to imagine working with the Democrats in a productive way. I've, I've got a, a really dumb thing to say, right? I'm going to say it and I'm putting forward the case that it's, it's dumb. I'm ready. Didn't the right wing come in and take over the SPD? Yeah. And the SPD I mean, is still one of the biggest well, parties in Germany at the moment. It's like second biggest party, I think. Well, now, Tom, you, you know why in advance that seems dumb. I know it's a dumb question. I know. That's why I said it's dumb. Like that, that's, now, <laughs> I'm fully aware of that's a dumb question. It, it, it has occurred to you that the state, state and capital, you know, are lined up behind something that supports state and capital. That's why I'm saying it's dumb. Okay. But the thing is, is that I, I do think it's possible that parties can be taken over and their nature changed. Look at the Republican Party in America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, under under Trump. Not just under Trump, under under Lincoln. Okay. It was a party against slavery. <laughs> Man, from Lincoln to Trump, Jesus. And now it's now it's the racist party. Right, right. We can't get too caught up in the fact that this party represents so what it does now in some sense. I think that that's kind of a misleading thing. These party formations can completely change. You know, I think they can completely change. I don't think it's unreasonable to think that a Labour Party could go from a, a like a kind of a, a Labour aristocracy. What would you call the Labour Party? It's some kind of Labour aristocracy kind of trade union party to Social Democrat Party to a radical democratic socialist party. I don't think that shift is an impossible shift. Now, I'm not saying it's going to work. I'm not going to say that it's correct, the right strategy or anything. But I don't think that that shift is an impossibility. The, the big thing is what we want to get to is a situation where you have a radical commie party that has 20% plus of the electoral vote. I think before these strategies can even be a, a thing, before they're not just weirdo trots in or whoever, commies like me or whatever, sitting, you know, in tiny little organizations. Like, so one thing about it is how do we get to a mass party I could tell you how we don't get to a mass party. I, I sincerely believe that we will never get to that majority, that end goal, by trying to change. I can't say the Labour Party with any, any, any certainty, right? But the more you've compared the Labour Party to the Democratic Party in our past debates, the more I think this is a dead end. And I think that try, and that you're, the possibility, logically possible, yes, like, Parties can change. Like, you can have a completely drastic change within the, either the Labour Party or the Democratic Party. But I think the social forces, right, behind a coalitionist party, and the Democratic Party isn't even nominally a Labour Party at all, right? Like, so let's not get that wrong. Like, we will never get to the majority support for a revolutionary minimum program. It'll never happen. I mean, I, I don't know if I don't know if I would write off majority support for, you know, a, a program like that. But I will say that, like, you know, the big first past the post coalition system, at least in the American context, seems high, like like it will always be a check. It will always have the reformist veto that McNair is talking about. I see exactly what he's saying. And I think splitting from that, I'll defend that logic. The idea that we're going to block up with people that have, you know, not only non-revolutionary, but not even reformist kind of viewpoint and and then convert them into, you know, some kind of evolutionary socialist formation. I mean, you know, you know what? Like maybe I'm really just like blinkered by history and I'm willing to take that like a, a look at that. But that doesn't seem like the way towards majority report for a revolutionary socialist program or for, you know, a socialist program at all. I think also, I think if, I think in the US specifically, if you want to do this kind of McNair strategy, you don't fuck with the Democrats, you fuck with the DSA. The DSA is these, you know, reformist adjacent that has a loyalist and, and some revolutionaries. Yeah. And I, I'm maybe. Not, not, maybe. And I'm not, right. thrilled, I'm not thrilled by that. I like, yeah. It's, that was a conclusion I, I came to, you know, a couple of weeks ago after doing one of these episodes that I was kind of uncomfortable with actually. But again, there are a lot of people that are abstentionists and a lot of people that are, you know... The DSA is the closest thing we have to, like, that for formation. Yeah, it's it, it's the closest thing we have to it. And, you know, are the costs of associating with that worth it? And that's, you know, that's just a that's a tactical question, it seems like. There's, right. there's a broad, like, strategic 
thing that we all, we all share. I don't know if it's just a matter of national context. I don't know the level of kind of nuance required to deal with that. But I, I guess um, to block up with a party that doesn't have the goal of replacing capital, but to serve capital, as in this paragraph, right, you know, at being an alternative government within this political regime, it, it invites a break. It invites a split because you have two different goals and you're just stapled together because of structure. Look, I think America, I think, say, for the Democratic Party, it's much more difficult to do what, say, has even to do what's happened in the UK. I just think structurally there are loads of just bullshit and yeah. how it's actually formally controlled and set up. So personally, I don't think it's possible to... To, to take a strategy that might work with a Labour Party and just implement that strategy in America. It's like getting towards that dumb idea of all these goddamn Leninist parties thinking that what haven't worked in 1917 is what needs to work in every country ever for the future of fucking humanity, right? <laughs> yeah, that co- copy and paste. The problem we have is that we've got loads of people who are... I think in, in society there are lots and lots of people who feel radical about politics, have got nowhere to go. So what you have to be able to, what as leftists we got to do in each different country is think of how do we get to that position where we can even start to represent those people. That's all that I'm exploring when I take the side of the goddamn Novara media. Like, and everybody knows that, you know, I don't think it's going to work, but we, we should interrogate the strategy, even like not the strategy that is existent in the UK or the US but even similar strategies what could even help to pose or get our brains thinking about getting into that position you know when I'm making these arguments you know somebody Dr. Forbin in the chat asked are we all reformists it's like fuck's sake (laughs) come on now doctor right but the, 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 the thing is we're looking for strategy we're looking for for strategies and we shouldn't rule shit out i do believe that we should if we get a party that's big enough we should abstain from fucking becoming a government i don't know if you want to abstain from actually sitting in parliament because there is a propaganda element to it but definitely abstaining from being the government we've thought about this quite a bit i think we've been fairly deflationary about the book towards the second half of this reading series and it's just i think worth mentioning what a nice foil McNair is, you know, and how useful he is for, you know, starting to think through these questions. Yeah. And like, I, I, I kind of roundly like on the whole agree with his strategy on the whole, but it's like saying that you agree with Lenin, you know, in Russia on the whole or something, you know? Yeah. There's a fair amount of different things going on here. There yeah. is, you know, not that I agree with Lenin in Russia. <laughs> so let me get that straight. Okay. No, no, no. It's yeah. just an analogy. Okay. Uh, Lexi, you read this goddamn thing. Let's move on. This is by no means to reject altogether either coalitions or blocks around single issues or electoral agreements that can assist in getting past the undemocratic hurdles set up to secure the monopoly of corrupt professional politicians. Provided these blocks or agreements do not involve either commitment to form a government or suspension of criticism, it is perfectly acceptable to enter in to such limited blocks or agreements, not only with labor and similar parties, but also with openly pro-capitalist ones. When, for example, the liberals and some Tories opposed the religious hatred bill, they served the interests of the working class, whatever their reason for doing so. I think this is worth commenting on. The example he uses is fairly you know, innocuous and is just sort of, you know, talking about a block around the single issue. But then, you know, coalitions and electoral agreements kind of imply something else. So this answers one of our questions. Does this only apply to a labor party? No, it also applies to pro-capitalist parties, including, you know, a right-wing pro-capitalist party like the Tories. Right. So if Tories are okay, why not Democrats? I think with the caveats given here, right, mm-hmm, commitment mm-hmm. to form a government mm-hmm. or suspension of criticism, you can kind of see that. And I, th- and I think like you, there's plenty of examples, like a pro-trans bill, for example, put for forward sure. by, by Democrats. I think socialists should like 
totally block with Democrats on that. Mm-hmm. Like that's something worth worth doing. Or right, instead of being like a complete left com about it and being like, it's keep this illegal for trans people, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's dumb. When he, when he says this here, for example, the Liberals and some Tories oppose a religious hatred bill, that was being active against the hatred bill, but it wasn't saying like forming like a, a coalition with them in Parliament. It was more of a kind of being active with them against it. Right. And you don't form a coalition to not take government in parliamentary systems, if I understand them correctly. Is he referring to like an informal coalition where yeah. like if you're you're in a minority, like you will agree to like try to block certain bills or try to like get certain things passed? Yeah, like I like I think, you know, in the UK, there's been two different ones. One has been like a, there has been a formal coalition. The Lib Dems have done it. And then then the DUP, this time with the Tories, are in a, a confidence and supply agreement whereby they're not technically in the government. But they will they will give they will back them under certain types of votes, basically, if they give them shit loads of money. Huh. So that's kind of they got a billion quid for Northern Ireland and they say we'll support you uh, and stop your government from falling under under certain circumstances. Go more into that example. That's really interesting. So th- they refuse to govern, but they're taking part of a governing coalition. Yeah, they call it confidence and supply. Which is basically, so under, I think for confidence votes, so vote of confidence in the government, which would mean if you lost it, the government would fall. They would always vote to have confidence in the government. Then the other one is supply. I think they would say they would vote as a default with them on stuff. I think if they didn't disagree with it too much, but like they weren't technically in government, they didn't have ministers. So it was really a minority Tory government, but they had this kind of side kind of weird non-coalition coalition but i don't even think that a uh, commie one should get into that because you're effectively supplying supplying support to whoever is the dominant block let me read something here let's let a professional do it now okay here we go uh joking um <laughs> i went to a school with a guy called joe king no no, <laughs> no. that's, just that's a bad true though joke. that is Stop. true uh joseph jo- king yeah joe joe king you be Whenever joking. we'd introduce him to somebody, yeah, we would always always say, "Oh, you must be you must be joking," and that was the joke. Anyway, <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sure he had a great sense. Of humor. Not particularly, as far as I remember, um, but I, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> of course, shouldn't slander the poor man. That's kind of what I imagine, yeah. actually. Yeah, no, he's got to deal with a lot of shit. Your name is Joe King. Yeah, can you imagine? Yeah, it'd be pretty bitter. Yeah. Okay. We should not take responsibility for government without commitment to radical democratic change, but we should propose or support both individual democratic reforms, such as the freedom of information or a reduction in the patronage powers of the prime minister, and reforms that strengthen the position of the working class, such as a national minimum wage or limitations on working hours. To oppose in the interests of the working class is also to build political support for the immediate defensive struggles of the working class against capital. Direct political support is valuable, but so is indirect support, where the Workers' Party, at every opportunity, challenges the undemocratic character of the political regime, its corruption, its statism, its dependence on the financial markets, and so on, and puts forward the alternative of the democratic republic, This activity serves to undermine the false claims of the regime to democratic legitimacy deployed against strikers, etc., etc. Undermining the ability of being able to use the electoral machine and being like, see, we have a mandate. That's almost something that already happens in governments now. But uh, and and it's definitely something that we shouldn't be falling over ourselves. Be like, no, man, it's like pretty democratic. You know, it is obviously not democratic enough. However... Again, I've said it before, this kind of stuff makes you think that McNair, to be consistent, really should prefer parliamentary regimes to Soviet regimes. I don't think it's, like, clear one way or the other, and uh, that alone Mm. is, like, a flaw, you could say. You know, I kind of think maybe he's vague about it because he doesn't want to, like, offend certain tankies, maybe. That's That's very plausible and and unfortunate in my estimation, but... be- because you know even though he kind of prefers the the trots that liked the soviet union you know like mm-hmm. i could see 
somebody doing that just because of how shitty the trots that, you know, went to social democracy were. And then, you know, once uh, upon reflection in our situation would still be like, yeah, it's nice. I could be gay in public and stuff, you know, it's like another it's like a miniature version of the poison pill of, of choosing between Stalinism and liberal constitutionalism, except for it's even sillier because we're dealing with trots who never had power. OK, now, ladies and gentlemen, we've got some bad, bad news or good news. We are on to the final, the very, very final chapter, segment of the entire book, 22 hours later, 22 hours, 48, 50 hours later, we've got Patience. Oh my God. There we go. Special effects. Did you like that special effect? We sure do. Oh God, kill me. I did like that special effect. 10 out of 10. Damn, patrons. Y'all are really, you know, stepping up Tom's game here. <laughs> Thanks for doing it. Subscribe. Patreon.com slash from Alpha to Omega. I got myself one of the drummers from the marching band from, from the Queen's regiment here today. Wow. Wow, that's... For, for a socialist podcast, that's pretty impressive, Tom. Yeah, and g- on a good union wage. <laughs> it's no, wonderful. No. I, have him, uh, I have him handcuffed to the radiator. He's here against his will. Well, yeah, if they're for the, if they're drumming for the queen. <clears throat> this is a requisition from a specialist that's loyal to the previous regime, to to the mon- monarchical regime. I got him into the house. I I kind of left like like kind of like Tom Tom. I left little stickers of the queen mother all the way along from the barracks in Woolwich <laughs> all the way to my house. He finally came in. I hit him over the head with a frying pan, locked him to the radiator, got the drum, bought my drum out, and that was it. Right. I feel like we should read every third word each in this paragraph, but that probably wouldn't work very well. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a good way to make this immolate right at the end. So, <laughs> Sophie, why don't you take the last bit of reading? We'll do the whole, we'll do the whole shebang. There's some good uh, French words in here. Should be, should be good comedy for everybody listening here. Oh. Listen to these Yanks trying to say Italian and French words. Fantastic. Hit it. <laughs> The strategic or <laughs> sorry, and some English the words str- there. The English ones are hard too. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. Okay, <clears throat> the strategic orientation demands patience. The fundamental present problem is that the failures of the strategies of the 20th century and the absence of a Marxist strategic understanding. Most socialists are socialists by ethical and emotional commitment only. This leads to the adoption of get-rich-quick solutions that enter into the capitalist, politicians, government games. This is the trouble with ideas that the LCR should join a new gauche pluriel project rather than addressing seriously the question of unity with lut au voix, with refundazione, <laughs> decision to participate in the priority government with the Linka's participation in a coalition with the SDP in Berlin, with the Scottish Socialist Party's orientation to a Scottish Nationalist Party-led coalition for independence, with respect. The result is not to lead towards an effective Workers' Party, but towards another round of brief hope and long disillusionment. A different sort of impatience is offered by those who split prematurely and refuse partial unity in the hopes of building their own, quote, Leninist Party, the socialist alternatives split orientation in the process of formation of De Linka, the splits of the Socialist Party and workers' power from the Socialist Alliance, and so on. We find that although these sects sell themselves as revolutionary, when they stand for election either to parliaments or in unions, their policies are broadly similar to the coalitionists. They are still playing within the capitalist rules of the game. The left, in other words, need to break with the endless series of failed quick fixes that has characterized with the 20th century. It needs a strategy of patience, like Kotsky's, but one that is internationalist and radically democratic, not one that accepts the existing order of nation-states. There, that, that wasn't so bad, was it? So, fucking hell, we're here. Like, this book, for me, is wrapped up, honestly, in the last two sentences. Yeah. Yeah. The core of this book is, the left 
in other words, needs to break with the endless series of failed quick fixes that has characterised the 20th century, including that splits. It needs a strategy of patience, like Kautsky's, but one that is internationalist and radical democratic, and not one that accepts the existing order of nation states. That's it. Like, that's what is really brilliant about this book. Those two lines, the two sentences. Like, these things are kind of like obvious to me, or, you know, was always my instinct, whether I ever had it strategically explained, I would say no. But, like, it's very, very difficult to argue with those two sentences. Yeah, I, I feel like everybody who's participated in this reading series, we all have our quips and, and gripes about some of the details and some of the things that McNair is saying in, in the particulars. But at the core, with these two sentences that you're talking about, I feel like we all agree, except for maybe Derek, who's grumpy. But <laughs> besides that... But in principle? You no, I think Derek would agree with this. Because, just, like, his I'm objection him. Would, something, would be something like, like, does he mean radical democratic or something like that? Which I, I think is actually, like, a fair point. And I think, like, the broad strokes of these two sentences we agree with but what does he mean by radical democratic? Like, does that even mean we still agree at that point? And what's not, and what isn't a fail, like a, a failed quick fix? Is entryism into the Labour Party? You know, maybe that's not a quick fix or something, but like, how far does this go? Because Tom, you added in like splits. He actually doesn't say like splits here. And in fact, he argues for a version of, he, he defends Lenin in the classical social democratic split. But that doesn't mean that he would want people to, like, split right now from the Labour Party, necessarily. Like, no, he's he has a sober interpretation of splits, which I can appreciate. Like, I think if you're going to do that, if you're going to do this kind of thing with, like, the Labour Party, or if we're going to do this kind of thing with the DSA, which, don't misquote me, I don't know if that's a good idea, but if you are going to do that, you would most likely at some point have to split. You just can't be a fucking trot about it and split the moment you get an itch, you know what I mean? Like, I think he has explicitly, you know, the idea of patience is the absolute opposite of splitting in its current form. In its current in form. In its current form. Yeah. The whole thing is that we need to get to having a large radical party in every country. And in each country, you you might have different strategies to get to that position whereby you can implement this. Yeah. You can implement this as a small party. Well, you know, but it's it's meaningless. You know, the Red Party in America could have been a, a McNair party, was it? I it, mean, it was an attempted McNair party. I, oh, 20 people. You're being generous. Huh? It was an attempt and it, it could have had like a little bit of purchase in like a section of the Marxist center as it currently exists, maybe. Grant and I sometimes talk about where we'd be if our our uh, Leninist grift paid off. You know, we could have been a contender. If we, you, you wanted to play sect ball, you know what I mean? And, like, do that kind of thing. The, the, mo- like, the most influence we would have. You know, we could, we could, you know, be influential, you know, in lofts in Brooklyn more so than we are, or something along those lines. But, yeah, that's about it. Like... From a strategic standpoint, like, what is there to do if, like, forming, like, a small, irrelevant party isn't the thing? Like, what, where do we start? Like, you know, sniffing around the Democrats isn't the thing? I can't even really imagine, like, what kind of abstracted form of, like, radical democratic project would put a dent in the wheel here, you know, to butcher some metaphors. Because... I kind of agree that, like, expecting unity on a socialist program immediately is, like, pretty, like, premature, because mostly because socialists don't even, can't, like, plausibly draw up, like, real programs for some reason, in a way, at the moment. I don't don't really know what that is. Maybe it's just my ignorance on it, but it doesn't seem like that's really happening. Even the DSA stuff or the sort of analytical Marxist adjacent attempts to put, you know, blueprints for market socialism or something to sound mind-bendingly utopian and seem to assume you know a, a more habitable planet than they assume we're going than than it looks like we're headed for yeah i guess i am for you know a movement that is democratic and pluralistic 
where socialist ideas aren't the common currency necessarily and have to be fought for. I'm for whatever radical democratic movement, whatever is an actual sort of radical outburst, whatever ways that that can end up becoming democratically expressed, that energy to the degree that it's not distorted. I'm for all that. But it's hard to imagine this in a way that it doesn't become bourgeois coalitionist just by default. And for something to not immediately be a socialist movement or something, but has that radical democratic element against the powers that be, is probably the orientation that soberly we end up having to take. How does that not basically just mean that the socialist bloc with like a vaguely populist kind of program or whatever, or is that even a bad thing? I mean, I don't think the populists have a program either. Maybe but I'm wrong. Maybe not, maybe not program is the right word, but like there isn't a populist party e- either. Do we just block with like populists? I think you're, what you did was very illuminating and elaborating on like the problems that we face, but it didn't solve it either. I don't think no. you were attempting, you, <laughs> you weren't attempting to either, but like I just keep like the thing that's kind of been unspoken this entire time about this book is it's assuming a lot more than what we have. And maybe that's, this is, this, well, it's not even maybe, like, if this isn't the case in a lot of European countries, right? But I think right now in the US, and, you know, it sounds like in the UK as well, like, how do we start this? How do we get, how do we get a, a Kotskian, like, strategy of patience, Marxist center strategy off the ground that isn't just going to, like, look and smell like a coalitionist strategy? I, I don't know. In, in this last section, okay, just to chew on some of these paragraphs more, right? After the failures of the 20th century, that's Leninism. That's also social democracy. And, you know, to whatever degree there's a, there's a you know, Marxist autonomous tradition that makes sense. It, it's not like it surged after the wall fell. So in the absence of strategic understanding, most socialists are socialists by ethical and emotional commitment only. 100% true. Totally real. There's even a whole move towards thinking of socialism as ethics first in socialist thought. Wow, a return to Kant. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. That's never been tried before. It certainly hasn't. Nobody knows why you would ever leave that position. But the, the whole uh, get rich quick solutions that feed into capitalist politicians, you know, 100%. That's That's what happens. But apparently this is the problem with these particular, like, left unity efforts which i don't know is that the problem with the left unity efforts what is what the problem the ethical and emotional stuff at least to a get rich quick solution because i think that's this is broadly true for a lot of the things where people are blocking with bourgeois parties and trying to make that happen but for stuff like i don't know like like trot unity or i don't know i'm, I'm thinking of marxist center in the united states a lot of these people believe in some kind of abstentionism, and a lot of them believe in sort of community organizing work that will take a long time and doesn't have an odd, obvious immediate payoff. And obviously in the back of their minds, they're, you know, building the movement so that they can stick a party on it. But that's a long, long, long ways off. You know, for a lot of them, they and I don't know if that's just the point that he's trying to address here, but I imagine that there are parallel situations like that in Europe. The problem isn't even get rich quick. It's like uh, maybe it plugs more into his stuff about emotional and ethical commitments. But community organizers that think Pol Pot did nothing wrong or something in the back of their minds. <laughs> like some of those people are in it for the long haul. But I guess that that falls into the ethical and emotional thing. But, you know, these people are kind of the closest to trying to do something truly, truly independent. You yeah, know? I guess that's kind of like, let's, let's take like a Steel Man version of that, like, for example, <laughs> like, it's not some dork who's like, standing Pol Pot in the back yeah, of the mind or whatever. Yeah, but no. let, let's, take, let's take a Steel Man version of that and just somebody who wants to build up, you know, kind of going off of like a, you know, more merger formula, like there's no point in building up the socialists if there is nothing to merge with, or whatever, however you want to frame it, like they're focusing yeah, on the without, social first, because right. the political is so dismal right now, right? And then the idea of sticking the party on top of that, right? Like, mm-hmm. Not purely for instrumental reason, but like they're trying to do Marxism, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah, so yeah. once we have a social base, mm-hmm. let's let's like tackle the political, right? Like, is that even such a bad idea? No, it's 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 not terrible. It's it's not it's not like the worst 
you know, of the strategies. It's not going whole hog into the political sphere and, you know, just reaping the social alienation. No, it's not bad. That's why I, I'm wondering if this addresses what the problem with that is. I think there, you know, there there are problems with that. Like, in a way, they're insufficiently, like, discriminating about totalitarianism sure. in their ranks. But, like, is there, a, is there one of us here that wouldn't send somebody to death for wearing glasses? I asked thee. <laughs> I'm taking off my glasses. What did you say? <laughs> you heard me. I've had, I don't know if the listeners know, but I've had people from the Dutch Socialist Party and also, I think, from Swedish Socialist Party who've been listening to the series. Like, I could imagine with a lot of, a lot of pain that these young people and activists could actually try and democratise their socialist parties and they could actually get radical, proper communist policies through and they could not go into coalition and they could grow and they could be seen to work for the people. And I could see it working in Sweden or I could see it working in, in Ireland or I could see it working in France. I could actually see this as an actual strategy that would work. When it comes to America, you can't get to the stage where it could work. Right. You yeah, can't even get to the stage where it could work. It, it seems like PR is the difference, but maybe that's too reductive. I think where it can also work is like, so for example, if the Scottish Nationalist Party, for example, they are kind of, they're a sock dem party. But if they, if you have a nationalist thing going on, you can gain nationalists and you can gain radical commies. And you can, you can do it that way too, in a first past the post. Like in the UK, for example, the only places where the Labour or Tories aren't the party is in Scotland, in Wales and in Northern Ireland. Because in Wales, you got Plaid Kimru, they're the Welsh nationalists. In Scotland, you got the, you got the SNP, Scottish nationalists. And in, in Ireland, you basically have, Northern Ireland, you got the, you got Irish nationalists. And then you also, they actually don't even have the Tory party or the Labour party up there for some weird reason. I think they were actually illegal at one stage. So they have like unionist parties and nationalist parties. So I think like in America, you don't have that kind of nationalism that's local. You know, you don't have in any real sense, you don't have free Texas motherfuckers, free Texas. You know, it's not a thing. There's a few weirdos, but it, it, it's not a thing. It's, it, it's only an ideological thing, that's, but it's folded into the big parties for the most part. Right. As a, as a strategy, there are definite things, I think, we can take from McNear's work to those places and ideas. But, you know, like any proper chess player or poker player, the, the, the scene is different. You know, the structural impediments are different. So the strategy should be different, you know, certainly up to a point. And I think that's at the point where I, I have most issue with the book. Now, we'll get into Coxshot's critique later on. Like, so I think Coxshot has got some excellent critiques that go maybe somewhat further than McNair in certain directions. But my other critique is that McNair thinks like Lenin and all these were right to, sp or the split in the, in the social dem SDP SPD was correct. But like, for me, the problem is before that, could you have the right split from you instead of the left splitting from the right? And that to me is the big error in strategy or, or politics of the SPD. Not so much the, just the simple voting for war credits. I think it seems to be that the fact that they weren't prepared or they weren't really well up for that fight, knowing in ahead that this fight was going to come. I find that is the major failing. Not so much they ended up voting for the war credits, like because I'm sure there would have been a split. You would have the right split, like the right are splitting from Corbyn from weakness you will have the right split from the from those from weakness like to me i think that mcnair is too dogmatic around around that thing i think there's definitely some you know i'm not saying i'm right but i think that that that, that is open that that question is open for debate but when it comes to the idea of patience and all that i i wholeheartedly agree well you know why that is a little fetishistic and awkward about that specific moment is because if you take his strategy seriously, the initial merger of the Eisenacher Marxists, like the old school pre SPD kind of formation, their merger with the Lasallians was the mistake. That's the big mistake. Don't do that. 
Like, and that would be the lesson of the whole thing is don't do this. Or at the very least, if you're going to merge with them, then do it under a radically, you know, communist program or something. Don't make so many concessions to them. Like you, you have to like keep your program radical. Yeah, wasn't it true that LaSalle was like much more willing to compromise than what ended up happening, actually? Like he was very desperate to... That's what McNair said, and I don't know no- enough about the LaSallian... To confirm that. Yeah. I could imagine that the original group could have grown without the LaSallians. I, I could imagine that could have happened to a large force. Right. Yeah, like the t- there's two things there. It's like, can you maintain... Is it possible... You know, you're obviously at a disadvantage, but is it possible for you to bring in elements of the right and to stay on top of them? That, to me, is like probably against you, but that doesn't mean that it's not possible. That's one thing I would say. You know, I think it's a probability function. They didn't manage to do it. You know, maybe they could have done it. That that's my that's my kind of major point, and I think that if you do do it, and if the to gain traction, a part of your strategy could be to to force the right house after you get them in. I think that's also a strategy, to make it like unpalatably radical, such that the right has to leave from a position of weakness, and then you have grasped and swallowed a lot of their support. So that's to me that's also a, a strategy that's worth thinking about. Right, like there is an alternate sort of 1914 where Lenin's hero Kautsky doesn't waver in the face of war and says, no, not one penny, not one man, we're not doing this. Doesn't, and is, is much more strongly against the war and, you know, much and condemns the right much more strongly. Kautsky did have an inordinate amount of historic agency at that moment. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, if he hadn't been softened up to the Bernsteinian right so much if he took a more radical position then, you know, that could have been what happened, Tom, that they, that they would have took a lot, a big mass of the workers with them and the right would have thrown a big tantrum about it. And that there would have been a conflict that was more in the socialist favor. And so that's possible. It's not like totally impossible, but it's, it's telling that history did go this way, right? Like, it's telling that even somebody like Kautsky didn't go that way. Yeah, but it's a it's a tiny sample. And the thing is not even, you know, Kautsky, some of Kautsky's politics were pretty goddamn mixed up and not as good, you know. Yeah, on imperialism. On, yeah, but even on on, uh, the, on the nature of parliament and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, yeah and, that's true too. You know, so it's like we shouldn't make, like getting towards Puya's critique, which is correct, I think, if a little overstated, but like that they should be done in probabilities because you can't say because it didn't one work work once that it, it, it will never work. And it's like, like I was a poker player, right? You can play perfect strategy and you can lose, right? You can go and play poker for 12 hours straight and you can play every hand perfectly according to your strategy, okay? And you can get smashed up because sometimes things aren't, going to go your way sometimes luck random occurrences come in and will de- destroy it you know destroy your your plans you know you you, you look at a, a helicopter it's designed and it really functions well but sometimes a goddamn gust of wind will cause it the damn thing to crash you know what i mean even though it's it's designed for 99.9999 percent of gusts of winds so your strategy could be correct and you could still get blown onto the rocks that doesn't appear to be the story of the 20th century. No, I think it's, on, on the contrary, I think it's, at best you could say... But your point stands. Your, your point stands, but what, what, it, what it appears to be is that these, that strategic mistakes on the part of the social democrats and, you know, the communists were extraordinarily costly. You could be right that, you know, actually, they, they played their hand perfectly well. And, you know, that would have been the winning strategy, but... I don't know, something happened that, you know, blocked that. And maybe it's just an emotive point or a sort of, you know, we live in this world where things turned out this way. So even if you're statistically right or something, try convincing a lot of people. Let's do that again. Well, and I think Tom's point and Puya's point by extension is, and it's something I've been thinking a lot about, but I think their point is deeper. Like the point that Puya often makes is like, you know, I'll say like, oh, well, this is like failed, like, X amount of times, you know, sample size of not much, one t- to ten, maybe. 
-hmm. And therefore, it's, like, dumb. And, you know, Puyo wants to do a probability because, like, what if, you know, it's the 11th time and it works? But how high a number do you need? Right. And, and, I, and we and we have, like, kind of... There's a counterpoint of, like, this, you know, when you're doing an analysis of history, like, you have a limited data set, so you have to, like, go off of what you have available. I, and, and there's, like, hard sciences that have to function in a way sure. like that, like astrophysics or something, you know, th there's some, like, big cosmic events that there's... You know, how many countries are there on, on the planet with parliaments? You know what I mean? Like, the historic conditions are different, but there's at least some, like, laboratory similarity. Sure. When you're studying, like, a once, like, like a cosmic event like the Big Bang, you know? Like, a scientific approach to that is, is you know, borderline metaphysical sometimes. I agree I agree with this point, but I, I don't know. I think it, ha it has to be tempered. I agree with you. I, I just sort of... I, I'm a little more... I trust our data a little more than I think that kind of stream of argument does. Yeah, these things could have worked out, but the fact that they didn't, it might very well say something about this line of strategy, and we have to investigate that. Like, it definitely does. It definitely does say something about the line of strategy. You know, from a, a Bayesian statistical point of view, it increases the likelihood that it's the incorrect strategy. Unden undeniably it increases the likelihood. And if you're a betting man, it should make you go for the other strategy and make that one more likely and try an alternative one. You know, you shouldn't just keep trying the same strategy. Like, under, going by my previous logic, you, you know. I don't think that's what no, you're I saying. No, I know that. But like, you know, you could take it to extreme. You could keep trying it, which is exactly what the fucking left does. It keeps trying like Leninism. It keeps trying Trotskyism. It keeps trying anarchist ones. It keeps trying all these weird ass split split ones. We right. split our way to the fucking revolution. It's it, it's a bullshit idea, right? But they they keep trying it. So like it, the the likelihood that it's the probability that's correct will go down, 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 down. Yeah. So uh, like I certainly think it's the time for us to try a different strategy and or look and we should look theoretically both both empirically. What McNair does is good. He empirically looks at what was good and he also looks kind of theoretically about what would would make a good argument. And we should be combining those two. That's our lot. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and The Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show was a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network's sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, and Swampside Chats. A hundred years of Rick and Morty!